Uh, this has been quite an extraordinary meeting, and uh, we're starting off this morning in an extraordinary way. Uh, first of all, we rarely have uh, surprises at the American Law Institute uh, at our meetings uh, in our program, but today we have an actual surprise because we had not announced until this morning uh, who was going to be awarded the Henry J. Friendly Medal. Uh, let me first, before I say that, say that we are thrilled to have so many friendly clerks with us, and I would just like to say welcome to all of you. I, I was thinking this morning when I got up, I, there, I cannot imagine all of the jokes that have been endured by being a friendly clerk. I mean, there's just a lot of, <laughs> and in fact, most of the clerks I've ever encountered weren't that friendly to me, but um, uh, we'll just move right on. So let me announce uh, that the friendly medal has been awarded by the Council of the American Law Institute this year to Judge Pierre Laval and Judge Michael Boudin. And let me invite uh, into this uh, very merry band of scholars, judges, and practicing lawyers like me to present the friendly medal, the Chief Justice of the United States, Henry uh, uh, John Roberts, and who's <laughs> very friendly too, and Pierre Laval. Michael could not be with us today, but we will, of course, uh, send him a record of the proceedings and his wonderful medal. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Justice of the United States, I hope. <laughs> the Chief Justice, someone well known to us, our Director Lance Liebman. The Friendly Medal, of course, honors uh, someone who is a great, great judge, but also a great leader of this organization, the American Law Institute, and tremendously devoted to this, to this organization. It's a medal that's given <laughs> not every year, but only when there's somebody available who, who seems like they, they've earned it, and, uh, or in this case, two people who have definitely earned it, and, uh, 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 and it has been given uh, 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 to a number of very distinguished people in the, uh, in the American world of law. The, the, um, um, uh, let me just say very briefly in, in my, in the introduction I'm uh, doing that, that uh, uh, you do feel old when you taught property law to the Chief Justice of the United States. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and, and I, it's been a great value to him because he was fully prepared at his confirmation hearing for any questions about the rule against perpetuities or, <laughs> or, or covenants running with the land. So much so, I think the, the, the senators knew who had, who had taught him, so they didn't even bother to ask any questions <laughs> about that. Um, to be slightly serious for a paragraph, you know the line, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we also then try very hard to be strong enough to support on our shoulders people who will be future giants. And that's a way to think, I was thinking about this in the middle of the night, a way to think about the, the, the relationship to law clerks and, and between law clerks and judges, and the law clerks are often very outstanding people coming out of law school. They learn a tremendous amount in the clerkship. They then move to, into the legal profession. And, and the list of the 31 friendly clerks uh, that's at the back of, of, of uh, David Dorson's biography of Judge Friendly, which some of you should read, uh, uh, is an amazing list of, of, of where those people are now and what they've done and the judges they've become and et cetera, et cetera. The, the, um, um, uh, the, the, uh, um, um, so, so, uh, 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 the Chief Justice was, uh, um, uh, a clerk for Judge Friendly, so it's, it couldn't be better than for him to present the, uh, the medal to Michael and, Michael and Pierre. 
I'll finish with one quick story, and, and uh, this is the last one of the thousand, Mr. <laughs> Chief Justice, that these people have had to endure my telling in my 15 years in this job. But, but uh, some of you met uh, last night our two kids who are 45 and 47 years old and nice enough to come down for the dinner last night. And, uh, um, um, and, and it reminded me that when they were something like six and eight or five and seven, something like that, uh, we brought them as tourists to Washington and uh, uh, we looked at the Lincoln Memorial, whatever we did. And then we went over to the Supreme Court where I had been a law clerk for Justice White and of course the justice was nice enough to, uh, 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 to meet with them for at least five minutes or whatever and, and it was a great experience. And then we came out and of course the front door you could use in those days and came down the grand stairs and we're standing there out on the street and our older son Jeff uh, said, uh, 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 on the shelf in, in Justice White's office there was a football. Why was that, Daddy? And, and I said, well, he led the National League Football League in ground gaining while he was full-time student at Yale Law School flying to the games on Fridays and, you know, whatever, and an All-American, whatever. And, and I go through this stuff, and Jeff says, I should have gotten his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chief Justice. <laughs> This is a wonderful opportunity for me to publicly thank Professor Liebman for something that I suspect he does not even remember. It was about this time of the year, my third year in law school, that I learned there was something called a third year paper requirement <laughs> uh, at the school, and that this required a faculty sponsor. Now, uh, the Law school was a much less personal place back then than I'm sure it is now, but I did not have many options to choose from uh, in selecting a faculty sponsor with about 10 days to go before the paper was due. But I was told that Professor Liebman was a soft touch on things like this, and he turned out to be. Absolutely. So, uh, but for him, I'm pretty confident I wouldn't be here today. Uh, Uh, thank you very much uh, to the ALI for inviting me to present the Friendly Medal. I have been a member of your organization since 1990. My record of attendance has not been good. Um, <laughs> but the Institute is, as you know, dedicated to clarifying and improving the law. And I think I have done my part for the Institute over the past several years. It has been in the nature of what I remember being called when I was at the law firm, business development. <laughs> my, <laughs> my colleagues and I, uh, my colleagues and I have been doing a very good job of ensuring that the Institute would have many opportunities to clarify and <laughs> I was privileged very much to be a law clerk to Judge Friendly, and uh, finishing up the third year of law school, the schedule was such that he asked me to begin in the fall, and that was fine. So I took a job at a law firm in New York for the few months before the clerkship would start. Two days before my graduation, I got a call from the judge saying the schedules had been changed and he would like me to begin on Monday. <laughs> uh, now this put me in kind of a pickle. I said, well. I'm sure I will, but I've committed to this law firm to uh, work for them over the summer. It's something, a little bit of a chuckle on the other end of the line, and he said, law firms in this town are used to having me change their plans. <laughs> <laughs> and I began the next Monday, and the, the law firm survived without my services. <laughs> The Institute has chosen uh, well. Uh, the recipients, Judges Mike Boudin and Pierre Laval, are extremely worthy uh, honorees. I've known each of them for 35 years, and I can attest to that personally. They embody the judges' uncompromising rigor and integrity in following the law wherever it may lead. 
No one today uh, is remotely like him. Uh, no one has been remotely like Judge Friendly uh, since he passed. And no one will be like him again in our profession. Uh, consider what he was. He was the greatest judge of his era, which is the subtitle of the new biography out about, about him. And I think there's no disputing that. But he was also a leading scholar and writer and thinker in the law. His law review writings and his speeches are still looked to today and still widely cited. Specialists in different areas of the law compete to claim him as their own. Securities lawyers will tell you that was his forte, securities law. Those who practice administrative law will say that was his, his first love. People whose work involves them in questions of federal jurisdiction will say surely that was top on his list. Even practitioners of railroad law would say, no, no, that was his favorite subject, <laughs> a subject he learned as chief judge on the Special Railroad Reorganization Court. Working on the Second Circuit was simply not enough judging for, for his tastes. Even criminal lawyers will point to his uh, very influential articles on criminal procedure and say that surely was where he was at his best. And then there are his contributions uh, to the ALI uh, as part of his scholarly uh, uh, record. I'm going to read just very briefly what was in the proposal submitted to the members of the ALI uh, when this medal was, was first suggested. Uh, they said, apart from the Institute's directors, no member since Learned Hand has made more of a contribution than Judge Friendly to the Institute's own projects. Uh, being an ALI proposal, there's a footnote, and the footnote says, <laughs> Judge Friendly was an advisor for the study of division of jurisdiction between state and federal courts, model code, code of pre-arraignment procedure, federal securities code, and corporate governance project. So he was the greatest judge of his era. He was a leading scholar. And he was a lion at the bar, a great practitioner uh, in New York co-founder of one of New York's great law firms. On top of that, he was a prominent member of the business community, general counsel to Pan Am, a member of its board, at a time where the air transportation industry was just forming the rules and guidelines that would uh, govern that, that industry. Uh, uh, and he played an extraordinary part uh, in that. No one like that today. I mean, who would you say? was the greatest judge, a leading scholar, a prominent practitioner, a business person. No one like that uh, uh, at all today. But there was no one like that then, uh, uh, if you think back on it. And there certainly will be no one like that in the future, not only because there's no judge friendly uh, coming down the pike, but our profession has changed so much that the idea of anyone, no matter how talented, being able to fill all those different roles uh, uh, is just not uh, not in the cards. Despite all of this, Judge Friendly was one of the most unassuming people um, that you could meet. Uh, I think it was Judge Posner who said, uh, Henry Friendly was the only one who was not impressed by Henry Friendly. <laughs> um, and you, you would see this uh, so many times as, as his law clerk. We would look at his um, official correspondence when it came in and look at the, what came out. And I remember a letter coming in offering him uh, an award and the opportunity to deliver one of a very prominent lectures uh, in the, in the uh, legal community at the time. And he wrote back a short reply expressing appreciation, but saying that he had to decline because it turns out he had nothing worthwhile to say. <laughs> uh, that, of course, uh, uh, is not would not have been remotely uh, true uh, then. I am not sure, frankly, uh, if Judge Friendly would be pleased to have an award named after him, because he was uh, uh, so unassuming. But I do know uh, that if there was going to be such an award, he would be delighted to have it presented to Michael Boudin and Pierre Laval. Uh, I asked for the letter that the law clerk sent to the ALI proposing uh, this uh, memorial for the judge, and it was uh, dug up from the archives. Mm -hmm. It was sent by a very small subcommittee of the judge's clerks. Uh, Bruce Ackerman was on it, Ruth Wedgwood. 
And, and I don't mean to suggest there's anything fishy about this, but uh, uh, Pierre Laval and Michael Boudin <laughs> were also on the, the subcommittee that was uh, proposing this award. Now, it was in 1986, so it was not as if they were just checking their own resume and, and making sure things uh, uh, lined up. But this is what uh, they said. They said the recipient could be a distinguished judge. Okay, Michael Boudin, check. Pierre Laval, check. An academic, Michael Boudin on the Harvard faculty, check. Pierre Laval, frequent uh, teacher at NYU, check. A government official, Michael Boudin, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, check. Pierre Laval, Assistant U.S. Attorney, Chief of the Appellate Section, and later in the uh, uh, New York County District Attorney's <laughs> Office, check. Uh, or a practicing lawyer. <laughs> Michael Boudin, famed administrative practitioner here in, in Washington, uh, Pierre Laval uh, in New York. Now, both in his academic work and his practice, Pierre, of course, is perhaps most famous for his contributions to intellectual property, and in particular, uh, uh, copyright. Uh, now, my court issued a copyright decision <laughs> on, on Monday. <laughs> Pierre, I, if you've read it, I hope you don't like it. Um, I, joined, I joined Justice Breyer's dissent <laughs> along with Justice Kennedy. So if it turns out you don't like it, you should feel good about that. Um, so practicing lawyers, Boudin, check, and Laval, check. The letter concluded this way, letter signed by Michael Boudin, concluded this way. The clerks feel that it is important to reserve the award for those who can be described as truly distinguished in the tradition of Judge Friendly and the Institute. Michael Boudin, check, and Pierre Laval, check. I am delighted to be able to present the Friendly Medal to Michael Boudin in absentia and to Pierre Laval, because I know that that's what Judge Friendly would have wanted. Thank you. Didn't the letter go on and suggest some names? <laughs> <laughs> this is overwhelming. In every detail, it's overwhelming to receive this award from the hand of Chief Justice Roberts. Thank you so much. To receive this award from the American Law Institute, which has contributed so vastly to American law. And, you know, during these last couple of days, it's been so impressive to observe, once again, the way intense debates are conducted here with such intelligence and civility. It's really extraordinary. And what a wonderful organization and what extraordinary, inspiring leadership we have, Roberta and Lance, it's wonderful. It's also wonderful to receive this award jointly with my dear friend, Mike Boudin, who so exemplifies the judicial virtues of the, of the great HJF. And Michael was uh, far and away uh, universally accounted to be the judge's best and favorite law clerk. Michael is sad that he couldn't be here today, but uh, he asked me to speak also on his behalf, and we consulted together as to what would be said. Finally, and most important, to be honored in the name of Henry Friendly, you cannot imagine what that means to both Michael and me. President Ramo told me that the younger members of our institute, and that means those under 60, <laughs> no longer remember much about Friendly, no longer know much about him, or know why the ALI so reveres him. So what about that? Why does the ALI hold the name Friendly? in exaltation. And uh, the Chief Justice has already told you a little bit about the judge. 
and I'm going to spend this talk telling you some more. First, to give you a sense of how Henry Friendly was regarded in his time, I'm going to quote from what purple-robed eminences of American law said about him. Judge Posner called him the greatest legal reasoner, the most powerful legal reasoner in American legal history. Herb Wexler, who guided the ALI for decades and was not given to scattering praises with <laughs> reckless <laughs> abandon, wrote, only the genius that Henry Friendly was could produce scholarly material of such quality and volume, none of us will see his like again. For Justice Frankfurter, he was the best judge on the American scene. Justice Brandeis in 1928, 1928 complained to then Professor Frankfurter, who had sent Friendly to be the justice's law clerk, don't ever send me another such I would not have a lick of work to do myself. <laughs> Thurgood Marshall, quoting from the celebrated Second Circuit rule, quote, learned, but follow Gus. <laughs> Thurgood said, the rule for me will always be, quote, friendly and follow friendly. <laughs> and a recent biography as the Chief Justice told you by David Dorson, labeled him the greatest judge of his time. So why such superlatives? I think the answer to that question is not complicated. Friendly knew and understood and explained law better than anyone. In every area on which he wrote, his were the seminal and clarifying opinions, powerfully reasoned, balanced and wise, at the business and art of judging, he was quite simply the best there was. To those of us who had the privilege of clerking for him, and a number of them are here today, it's wonderful to have them here to celebrate the great judge. His genius was all the more astonishing because we saw, as no one else could, the ease and speed with which he produced these extraordinary opinions. The power of Friendly's mind was simply prodigious. It was on a different order of magnitude than we encounter among even our most gifted colleagues. He carried virtually all of law in his head. It was simply, he simply knew it all. It was there. What is more, in his head, he saw clearly the junctions, overlaps, disputed territories, and uneasy interactions uh, among the snake's nests of rules that make up the not-so-seamless web. And his mind worked with the speed of computer circuitry. Uh, that is the, the speed of computer circuitry on, on a computer's good day. <laughs> when it came to writing an opinion, Friendly would sit down at the table surrounded by the briefs and appendices. He had read these rapidly, and he knew them absolutely cold. Uh, he would sit down and start to write longhand on a pad, and he would write at approximately the same speed as if he were copying a previously <laughs> written text. And that's exactly what he was doing, because the entire opinion from the first moment that he thought about it was all planned, laid out, organized, and written in his head, and he simply had to commit it to paper. He often quoted priceless gems from the opinions of learned hand, to do that, he'd get up, walk over to the shelf, and grab the right volume. He knew the volume number and the page. Indeed, the whole expedition of going over to grab the book was completely unnecessary. He could have written the whole quote down on paper, leaving his most tiny punctuation corrections to be made by the clerk. In this fashion, he regularly produced, as a rapidly written first draft, perfect final opinions. It often took scarcely more than an hour or two. For most of these opinions, the clerk had practically no role, apart from adding a few certs denied. Um, in most cases, there were no significant changes uh, to suggest. Uh, friendly rarely needed research on any point, as he <laughs> had it all in his head. Uh, the clerk's only significant contribution during the year of clerkship was occasionally, occasionally, to challenge some aspect of Friendly's analysis and reasoning. 
when the clerks had the insight and the courage to bring up this point to that rather gruff judge, uh, Friendly instantly understood all of the implications of the critique, and he instantly knew whether he loved the suggestion or had no use for it. In the latter case, you would hear something like, <laughs> the subject was closed. I heard quite a few of those during my year of clerkship, and as you can see, my memory of them remains vivid. <laughs> On the other hand, when the suggestion was one that he liked, it gave him immense pleasure. He instantly adopted it, and he glowed with a ruddy joy, something one did not see every day of the clerkship. Friendly's extraordinary opinions were only the start. As Herb Wexler said, he also produced an astonishing body of penetrating scholarly analysis on a huge range of subjects. He was deeply committed to important projects of, 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 of legislative reform. And as a diligent, always perfectly prepared member of the council, he contributed hugely to the work of this institute. Nor was Friendly a one-note law bore. He was a vastly cultured intellectual omnivore. He had read all of history, ancient and modern, all of the classics of literature and philosophy. He taught himself French so that he could read Proust properly. He knew and loved classical music. He had traveled much of the world. I remember that he once, during my clerkship, once he, he casually commented, that he uh, didn't have much use for Xenophon. And then he looked at me as if waiting for my response as to what <laughs> I thought of Xenophon. Well, he needed to wait another year for a law clerk. That was Mike Boudin, who could engage with him on Xenophon, Aristotle, Macaulay, Nietzsche, whatever. So why has the memory of this greatest of judges dimmed? And the answer to that question is, I think, a little more elusive. One reason, I suppose, is the misguided addiction of judges and, and law clerks to citing precedent in LIFO order. While everyone had looked to Friendly's opinions as the, as the guiding standard for whatever he wrote about, the cases that came to be cited first were the ones that merely repeated propositions that he had authored and explained. In a very short time, the friendly opinion dropped to third or fourth place in the list of citations, and then it dropped off the page altogether. Some of Friendly's most admirable judicial qualities also contributed to the obscuring of his reputation. He was a judge's judge, not flashy, not a headline grabber, not looking for quotable one-liners, he shunned the sort of rhetorical gambits that are designed to make the resolution of a complicated problem look more, uh, more uh, uh, incontestable than it really is. His opinions made difficult reading for lawyers, and their complexity made them inaccessible to those not trained in the law. Another reason for Friendly's puzzling obscurity was his inclination towards moderation. He did not seek opportunities to discard precedent in favor of results more to his liking. He was not interested in intellectually pure but impractical resolutions. He was a pragmatist, always attuned to the practical consequences of rules of law and to the tendency of abstract principles to push beyond their utility. He was keenly aware of how ill-suited court ill-suited courts and judges are to chart the course for society. His rulings were not destined to make headlines, not to be extolled in editorials. They were, nonetheless, the very finest exemplars of the judicial craft. Mike and I thank the ALI very warmly for this extraordinary and overwhelming honor. Thank you. <laughs>
Chief Justice and uh, Pierre, in the last few days I have had some of our new members uh, express to me surprise that they had been chosen to be in this company, a feeling I share pretty much every minute of every day. What has been so important about this morning is that you have told us what we are now supposed to do. Thank you very much for that. Chief Justice, I hear you have some other things on your plate this morning, and so we will uh, let you go and not have to uh, have you sit and vote with us on the following projects. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Well, what a way to start the last morning of the meeting, hmm? Huh?